Welcome to How Brands Are Built, where branding professionals get into the details of what they do and how they do it. I'm your host, Rob Meyerson. Thanks for listening. Thanks again to Squad Help, the world's number one naming platform for sponsoring this episode and every episode of season three. Speaking of which, today marks the final interview episode of the season, and we've got a great guest to mark the occasion. Denise Lee Yan is the author of the bestseller, What Great Brands Do, The Seven Brand Building Principles That Separate the Best from the Rest. She's also an in-demand keynote speaker and has appeared on CNBC, Fox Business, NPR, and in the Wall Street Journal discussing business and branding issues. Denise cut her teeth in lead strategy roles for the advertising agencies behind campaigns for Burger King and Land Rover and held client-side positions at Jack in the Box and Sony Electronic Inc. On this episode, Denise and I talk about the relationship between brand and business, why it's important to sweat the small stuff, brand experience and employee experience, and her latest book, Fusion, How Integrating Brand and Culture Powers the World's Greatest Companies. Here's Denise Lee Yan on How Brands Are Built. Denise Lee Yan, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. I'm looking forward to our conversation. So I want to talk to you about a couple of the books that you've written, and we'll start with your bestseller, What Great Brands Do, The Mm -hmm. Seven Brand Building Principles That Separate the Best from the Rest. One of the central themes in that book is something that you call brand as business approach. Can you just explain what that means? Sure. Um, Well, my approach to brand building is that there is really no, or there should be no difference between your brand strategy and your business strategy or how you build your brand and how you build your business in the sense that, you know, these two things are are, are really one and the same. Mm -hmm. And so brand as business management is just this idea that you run your business as if you're running your brand and and vice versa. And do you, in your experience, do you feel that there are some companies that do that really well, or whether it's a certain industry or are B2B companies better or worse than B2C companies, or is it just kind of all over the map? Some some companies get it and some don't. Right. I really think it's the latter. Some mm-hmm. companies and, and, and by definition, I guess some business leaders get it and yeah. some don't. Yeah. Is it without putting you on the spot too much? I know it's it's hard to, <laughs> to point out uh, brands that aren't doing that well, but can you give an example of maybe one that is doing it really well? And then if you're comfortable, if there's one that you think really needs to work on this idea of treating brand strategy as business strategy, what would that be? Right, right. Okay, well, um, a brand that is doing it really well is actually a brand that I have been using quite a bit, and that is REI, ah, yeah. the outfit, outdoor outfitter retailer. One of my favorite brands. Yeah, okay, great. And I've been using it a lot because we were actually gearing up for a pretty big trekking trip. And so we, we my husband and I alone have contributed to that company's profit <laughs> margin this year, but <laughs> like we were keeping the business afloat. But what really stands out to me is that, you know, their mission is about bringing the excitement and adventure of the outdoors to people. And I think that everything that they do, whether it's the way that they present themselves, kind of what you would consider to be traditional branding is in, you know, the kind of their logo and their their messaging and, and their their visual image, et cetera as well as everything they do as a company, the products they sell, the retail environments they create, the employees that they hire, you know, everything is all kind of a representation of this idea of the excitement and adventure of outdoors. And so to me, at least as much research as I've done on the organization suggests to me that they do really believe in their brand is their business and they run their business, you know, by their brand. And I think that is why they, they have continued to just, I think, continue to grow. Um, I talked about profit margin kind of jokingly, but I do believe that they they have a different corporate structure. So I can't say that they're necessarily more profitable than their peers, mm-hmm. but definitely business-wise are doing very well, customer loyalty, employee loyalty, et cetera. Yeah. I'm just curious, and this is maybe getting a little, maybe a little too philosophical, but you know, this idea that brands need to live up to their promise in real ways, in substantive ways, and not just lipstick on the pig, so to speak. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Not to be too cynical, but does it really matter whether it feels like they're doing that, whether they are able to, is it more that they're able to convince the outside world that they're living up to these ideas, or is it more about them really doing it, or is it sort of, is, is that just kind of too 
getting a little too philosophical about it all? Uh, well, no, I think that's a great question because I think that there are brands that manage to be built kind of more from the outside in and from kind of having an image and a message that is very compelling. But I think the difference is short-term versus long-term, mm-hmm. you know, whether they have the staying power, not only from the, the standpoint of, you know, are they able to a- attract and retain customers and attract and retain employees for a long period of time if they are not living up to their up to their promise. But um, more so that I just think, you know, we as c- customers do have like, we are so much more empowered and equipped to find out the truth right. about companies. And we're, and I always say that we have both the ability and the proclivity. I think that people really want to know if companies are what they say they are. And so there's, I think, a higher level of scrutiny, scrutiny and expectation that companies operate under these days where it makes it even you know more important than just kind of generally trust trying to run a good business. Yeah, those are two really good points. And I really like the first one that even – and again, I'm not, not to say that companies are, are doing this, or it's certainly not that they should, but even if they're able to sort of fool the public into thinking that they're living up to these ideas, it's, a, it's one thing to fool people outside the company. It's quite another to be able to not live up to your ideals in front of your own employees. And so, yeah, I see how over the long term, if your employees don't buy into it, you start to lose the best employees and your company over the long haul starts to to suffer as a result. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, you asked me for an example of a company that maybe isn't doing it well. And while I, I don't like to criticize, I do feel like one aspect of the whole we work debacle mm-hmm. or the we company debacle that has been unfolding the last couple of weeks, one aspect that hasn't really been explored very much is this kind of brand incongruity or kind of this gap between kind of this brand that they have been presenting and then kind of now um, through all of the kind of financial papers that have been released and us understanding what's really going on in the company, I feel like they aren't operating the way that they were presenting themselves. And I think that I, I was just listening to Professor Scott Galloway on um, talk about WeWork, and he was pointing out how like the employees are probably the ones who are suffering the most because, you know, th- these are, you know, men and women who have been grinding it out, you know, week after week, month after year after year for this company. Mm-hmm. Finally, they get like this promise of this payoff that they are going to actually, you know, get some thing back to them. And then the whole company basically, you know, I don't want to say falls apart, but I mean, you know, is, is exposed and far less valued than it was yeah. intended to be. And so, you know, when they, when WeWork says that they're all about, you know, togetherness and authenticity and, and it's like, as an employee, I would just have a big problem with that right. because that's not what's happening. Great point. I want to talk about some of the principles in what great brands do. So again, the subtitle is the seven brand building principles that separate the best from the rest. So I don't want to detail all seven. I don't think we have time for that. But there's one that stuck out to me, especially in the context of this season of the podcast, which is I'm trying to focus and have conversations about brand experience. So Mm -hmm. principle number five is great brands sweat the small stuff. Can you just Mm -hmm. go into that principle a little? Tell us more about that. And and I know there's also something called the brand touchpoint wheel that I think you bring up in that chapter. So I'd love to learn what that is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, yeah, you know, I think the truth is that all the little things that we do for someone actually do for them either in person, if we are in that kind of business model, or just kind of, you know, as we're delivering to them the value that we promise, um, all the little things we do far outweigh the big things that we say we do. And so sweating the small stuff is about ensuring that all those little details, particularly of the customer experience, are interpreting and reinforcing your brand values and attributes. And the brand touchpoint wheel is a tool that I use with my clients to identify all of those touch points, all of the different ways that someone from the outside world experiences your brand. And then the wheel, you know, it kind of looks like almost like concentric circles where the inner circles describe the departments or the groups or the functions within your organization that lead up to or are responsible for those for those touch points. And so the tool becomes not only identifying what those touch points are and identifying who's responsible, but then it can be used as a tool for 
for prioritizing, optimizing, and then ultimately kind of tracking improvements and tracking performance across those touch points. And so it, it looks like you make a copy of that touch point wheel available on, on your website as a download or there's sort of a worksheet that you yes. have. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. So if, I, if I'm trying to build my brand and I download that worksheet, can you talk through without detailing what's on the worksheet too much? I don't want to be redundant because people can go download mm-hmm. that themselves. But what, what is the process, you know, beyond um, just downloading that, that PDF? What do I do with it? Yeah. Well, the worksheet does take you through the, and it's, and, and there are very basic steps. It's really not rocket science, it's even not like kind of a higher order thinking, really. <laughs> it's very much like, you know, let's go through a thorough audit and think about all the different audiences or different stakeholders or different external people and groups. And, you know, let's audit all the different ways that they come into contact with us. And then let's work back from there and say, okay, well, you know, this, you know, particular page on the website, who, who writes the copy for that? Who actually program, decides what the design is going to be like, who actually, you know, designs that page and then who actually, you know, serves it and delivers it to the customer when they come to our website. And so it's very much kind of, you know, backing down from there. And then it provides some guidance on how do you prioritize which touch points you should focus on first. And then, and then from there, you know, you, you just go through the work of, of optimizing it. And once you've identified them, do you think as you go through systematically, you prioritize touch points and then you try to, as you said, optimize them? Is it is it mostly mm-hmm. about just making the customer experience as sort of universally good as it can be? So removing things that maybe aren't working well, or is it about tying it back to your specific brand? So making it especially relevant to your brand idea and differentiating maybe from yeah. other brands in your space? Yes, it's definitely the latter. Okay. And, you know, Rob, I can, you, you can just tell that you come from the same world where that's, it's critically important because, I mean, it's unrealistic, I think, for most organizations to think that they can do everything well mm-hmm. or to do everything well all at once. You know, and so it's really about identifying which touch which touch points are most impactful to our most important audiences, right? right? And then how can we interpret our brand in a distinct way? How can we do something different? In fact, that's one of the prior, the criteria for prioritization is just, you know, what are touch points that people in your industry tend to overlook that you could actually do something really distinctive? And, you know, one of the examples I use is uh, going back to REI, you know, when you walk into their stores, the door handles are ice picks. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those things that, you know, on every other door, like there's probably some retail door, retail store door, there's probably some nice door handle and you wouldn't even really notice it. But there's something about that kind of visceral grabbing this ice pick and opening the door and and that interprets the REI brand in a very unique way. And so it's identifying what are those touch points where you can do something creative and memorable and really bring to life your brand to have that kind of visceral or emotional impact on your customer. That's a great example. And I feel like oftentimes we try to have these sort of universal lists of, of touch points that work for all brands, but I can't imagine door handles being on one of those lists. So it really does <laughs> it really does surface that that need to do it for your own business and really understand, you know, what that customer journey looks like. Yes. There's there's certain a baseline where you have to like execute at a decent level on, on everything. But in terms of really optimizing, that's, yeah, that's where that comes in. So let's talk about your newer book, Fusion. Mm-hmm. And I'll, again, I'll read the whole title because I think these subtitles are so important. So, <laughs> so the new book is Fusion, How Integrating Brand and Culture Powers the World's Greatest Companies. Yes. And I know that culture played a role in what great brands do as well. So it mm-hmm. seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, like you've taken sort of some of the thinking from what great brands do and just zeroed in on that piece that's all about culture and written a longer book that goes into much more detail about that one part because it's especially important. Is that how you think of it? Yes. Yeah, pretty much. You know, um, when I was working on, you know, developing the ideas for my second book, you know, so someone said, well, you know, the most important part of what great brands do is, you know, chapter one, which is great brands start inside. And it's all about, you know, starting brand building with your culture. And they're like, so why don't you just write more about that? And at the same time, I will say 
two kind of more timely things happened. One is more personal. The other is more kind of just culturally. Personally, I had an engagement with a client who brought me in one year to help them kind of reposition and clarify their positioning as they were growing into new markets. And then the next year they had me come in and they really wanted me to work on their employee experience. And it was interesting how from their perspective, those two things were two totally different <laughs> ideas, you know, or, you know, and kind of the source material and kind of everything was different. And I was like, wait a minute. And this is a fairly large national retailer. And I thought if, if a company like this can't, doesn't get it, then there must be lots of other companies that don't get it. So I wanted to, so that personally happened to me. And then I think also just kind of more culturally, the employee experience, organizational culture, engagement, the the war on war for talent, all of that I think has really raised biz, the need for businesses to be much more intent on, uh, intentional about the kind of culture that they're building. Right. And so it's like all these things kind of were like, okay, yes, this is the book I'm writing. Yeah. Speaking of the war of talent, I, I feel like I've had over the past year, especially in Silicon Valley, where that war for talent is maybe um, most intense, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. more questions and, and client requests for employer branding or an employer brand platform. Is that, I know we're going to get more into what you recommend in Fusion, but is that something that you mm-hmm. recommend or how's your, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, I have a real issue with employer brand or employment branding. I thought you might. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, and I thought that's why you asked the question. Just because I do think it's kind of like, you know, advertising in the sense that like, you know, if you were just creating this brand to represent this idealized version of what you hope you're delivering to your employees mm-hmm. in order to, you know, attract and, and recruit them, then, you know, just like advertising, you know, if you built up this expectation and then you don't deliver it in the actual experience, well, that's the sure sure surefire way to lose employees or, you know, lose customers. And so I would, I recommend to my clients that they think about their brand values and attributes kind of at the center of the organization. And then, you know, everything they do for their customers is on one side and everything they do for their employees is on the other side. But it's, it's the same, again, same source material, kind of same, same value. Values and then you know your your recruitment efforts bring those values to life in in kind of the authentic and honest way. Right, it's that second point that I was expecting that that why would you have a separate brand strategy for your employees than you do for customers? Because it, if it is core to the business, if your business strategy is your brand strategy and vice versa, then why would you need one for employees and one for for customers? Exactly. And, you know, I I hope you I hope we have time and I hope you don't mind me going on a little bit of a rant. But, you know, one of the things that I see a lot of employers do is they like pump up a lot of their corporate social responsibility or their community activities in their employment mm-hmm. branding, which I understand because, you know, employees, again, do care about that thing. But it's like, why are you talking about a volunteer day that you do once a year when you should be talking about the experience that you provide for your employees that other 364 days a year, right. you know, and, and so, you know, if you can't represent to your prospective employees, the meaning and value of the work that they do on a regular basis, if, if that, if you, if you can't describe that or, or kind of convey that to prospective employees, then I think you have a real problem. And so that, that's like almost employment branding almost becomes a kind of a crutch, like, oh yes, yeah, so well, we can just talk about all these you know, great things we do for the community when we don't have to talk about what is it really like to work here and why is that important? Right. All right. Well, I want to talk a little bit about what you, what you do recommend. Um, yes. <laughs> so, so I want to read a little bit of the introduction to Fusion and, and then ask you a question about it. So you wrote, culture can't be imposed. As a leader, you can't force people to think or behave in a certain way. So I agree with that, right? I mean, and that's, I think, frustrating probably for a lot of leaders is they know how important culture is, and yet it feels like, well, what am I going to do about that? I I can't make people have a culture. I can't enforce, impose my own kind of idea of what the culture should be. So I know this is the premise of the entire book, but (laughs) let's kind of dig into it a little bit. I mean, what should business leaders or, or brand people do to create a great culture in their company? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I think it comes down to first believing that you can 
cultivate a particular type of culture. Like, and you can't impose it and, and, you know, you can't say one thing and then do another, but I think that you can have an intent or, you know, a desired culture and, you know, take, and then the, the top leaders of your organization then need to take responsibility for building that culture. So it needs to be, you know, a strategic leadership responsibility, um, which then means that it needs to be woven into everything the company does, kind of like brand, you know, in the sense that there, you know, there's not the separation between brand and business. Well, there's not a separation really between culture and business in the sense that the way you organize your company, for example, like the different departments you have and the different layers and, you know, the different groups that you have, that will impact your culture. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want certain groups to work better together or, you, you know, you know that from a customer experience standpoint, you need to have, you need to have these groups all integrated. Well, organize your company like that. And, and that will at least create an environment more where the, your, your desired attitudes and behaviors will come to life. Think about your operational processes, you know, everything from your planning process. You know, if you want to be nimble and agile, but, you know, you enforce a very strict annual planning process, well, you're not going to end up with an agile culture or, or you're going to have this kind of conflict that arises between trying to be agile and then trying to be very, you know, strategically aligned, you know, from day one. So, I mean, you kind of think about your process, everything from that to like, you know, simple things like approving expense reports and, and, you know, what does that look like? Or, you know, your, your compensation strategy or, you know, so you kind of have to think about all those things. And then specifically, one of the chapters in Fusion talks about employee experience and specifically how you need to deliberately design and manage your employee experience the way that you do your customer experiences. You can't just kind of assume that these things are going to happen, right. you know. So it takes a multidisciplinary effort to think about, okay, what are the different segments we have in our employee base and what are their needs and how do we create how do we create an environment? How do we give them tools and resources? How do we, you know, interact with them on a personal level to really develop this experience that embodies this desired culture. So it's you know, all of these steps, but it really is at the very fundamental level, believing that you can cultivate culture and that it is a strategic leadership responsibility. Great. And and that, that last part about really managing the employee experience, does that take mm -hmm. on a form somewhat like that brand touchpoint wheel, but now doing it for the employee experience? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, and, and so, yeah, I talk about it. I st started to mention this, but, you know, it's like you use segmentation just like you use on customers. And then, you you know, you use a design process and part of your design process is using a tool like the brand touchpoint wheel. Yes. This episode of How Brands Are Built is brought to you by Squad Help, the world's number one naming platform. Here's how Squad Help works. You launch a naming contest to engage hundreds of naming experts. You're guided through an agency level naming process that goes beyond traditional crowdsourcing. The platform uses AI and includes name validation features such as audience testing, trademark validation, linguistic analysis, and quality scoring. And Squad Help doesn't just do naming. You can also use their platform for taglines or slogans, as well as logo design. To launch your naming contest today, go to squadhelp.com and start receiving custom name suggestions instantly. Squad Help, company, brand, and business name ideas by experts. Today's episode is also brought to you by Rev.com, offering fast, affordable, accurate audio transcriptions and captions. I use Rev all the time to transcribe episodes of this podcast and also for recorded interviews I conduct during brand strategy projects for clients. I've tried some other services and I keep coming back to Rev because their transcriptions are the most accurate I've seen, their turnaround time is less than 24 hours, and transcriptions cost just $1 a minute. Right now, Rev is offering listeners of this show $10 off your first order. To get that $10 off coupon, visit rev.com slash blog slash HBAB for how brands are built. Again, that's rev.com slash blog slash HBAB. Rev, transcriptions made simple. Today's episode is also brought to you by Audible. For listeners of how brands are built, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. I just checked, and both of Denise's books, What Great Brands Do, and Fusion are available on Audible. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash HBAB for how brands are built. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash HBAB to get your free 
audiobook. Now here's back to Denise Lee Yan on how brands are built. It seems like a lot of startups do seem to actually have this idea of brand and culture. Just these days, it seems like a lot a lot of startups have that in mind, first and foremost, maybe more than 10 years ago, that there's just a general understanding that these things are important. By and large, is it the same, the same ideas and the same processes that you would recommend independent of that stage that the company's in? Not necessarily. You know, one of the things that I'm I'm particularly interested in and that I didn't have a chance to explore as much as I would have liked in my book is subcultures mm. and kind of orthogonal cultures and particularly when they arise from M&As or, you know, like when larger right. companies grow and they, they, you know, and and I think the process of uh, or the requirements for cultivating a culture in that kind of situation are very different because you are dealing with existing cultures that you need to align and integrate as opposed to like, you know, when you're starting up a culture and you're just trying to scale that one thing. Yeah, that integration of, of cultures during a, a merger or an acquisition seems really critical. Are, are there any, I know you didn't get a chance maybe to write about it as much as you want, but just based on your your research for the book and, and your work since the book, are there any kind of pointers that you would give to to CEOs or even to employees as the, that have maybe been acquired or, or something? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, one of the things is to acknowledge uh, the importance of culture in an M&A transaction. You know, everyone says it's important, but then they often do go forward with a transaction because of strategic or operational or cost financial reasons or right. whatever. And and I think I, I wish I had the number at my fingertips, but there's been some research that shows definitively that the, the top reason reason why M&As fail is because of culture. So I think just, you know, making, knowing that and, and making sure that you attend to culture and, and, and that you as, have that as part of the first assessment process is really important. And then not waiting until after you do the transaction to work on culture, but it should be part of the whole kind of transition process and, and kind of weaving it into everything that, that you do to bring these organizations together is critically important. And then maybe the last thing I would say is to acknowledge that, you know, existing cultures are hard to change. And, and it's usually because there are leaders within the organization or influencers within the organization who are not necessarily designated mm-hmm. leaders. So, you know, the presidents of your business units might all be in line with this is a great, this is a great transaction. This is, you know, this is going to work. We're going to do this. But there are other people who are very influential in the organization who are holding on to old behaviors or old attitudes or old values. And, and if you don't engage them in the right way and ensure that they are coming along with you, then your efforts can be de- derailed as well. Great point. Let's shift gears a little bit. I want to talk about a sure. blog post you wrote that you you mm-hmm. drew my attention to, this nine different types of brands. And in that post, you hypothesize that there are a finite number of ways that brands can compete and be positioned. So I'll read through those just for listeners. Mm -hmm. So the nine types are disruptive brand, conscious brand, service brand, innovative brand, value brand, performance brand, luxury brand, style brand, and experience brand. So I want to hear a little bit about your thinking that went into this and then also how people reacted to it. In my experience, anytime you suggest to the sort of strategy world that there's a finite way of doing anything strategically, it it (laughs) sort of gets everyone throws their arms up because they, they want there to be this infinite number of ways for things to work so that they... I mean, frankly, so that they always have a job, I think, right? Because they don't want it to feel like just choose one of the nine and, and you're good to go. So how right. do people react? And, yeah. and you know, how has your thinking yeah. maybe evolved since you wrote it, if at all? Right, right. Okay, well, and, and, I, and background, I should say that I worked on these nine types of brands as it relates to fusion, my book, and the integration of brand and culture, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But I say that because I want to explain that I did quite a bit of research on these nine different types, meaning research like consulting with other brand strategy professionals, um, reaching out to my 
email community, which, you know, has thousands of people in it and, and getting feedback and really kind of trying to listen and learn from people. So I felt like at least when I ended up where I did, that I had enough validation from people who I respected and, and people who were in my community that I felt like, okay, this is, I can say this with confidence, <laughs> you know, in addition to, you know, all my years of experience and blah, sure. blah, blah, all that stuff, you know, that everyone says. But I, I will also say that when I did introduce this idea, both in the blog post as well as in the book, I did I did have to put a lot of caveats right, out right. there. You know? So I had to say, you know, well, of course, every company, every brand needs to have an element of being service oriented or being innovative, being, you know, and so I kind of have to explain. So, you know, yes, you have to operate at a baseline in each of these areas, but you need to pick one. And that's what I mean by identifying a brand type. And so that I would say is kind of the biggest pushback or the biggest feedback I got is, you know, when I do my uh, keynote engagements and, and or I do a workshop on this and I talk about this, people always want to be, well, we're a combination of innovative and performance. And I'm like, pick one, <laughs> you know, you can have a lead and you can have a second, but pick one, you know. And so it's just getting people to understand if you don't put a stake in the ground and have clarity about what what your brand, like how your brand is positioned, how can you expect your customers to have that clarity? They need to have a very, you know, clear idea in your head, like this mental file folder that they put you in. And if you aren't, if you don't have that, how can you expect them to? Right. And so once a company has determined which one of those they think either represents them currently or, or aspirationally, they're trying to kind of point themselves mm -hmm. toward what do they do with that information? Is there a, is there a next step? Yeah. Yes. So there, there's definitely brand building steps in terms of brand positioning and kind of customer experience ideas that would flow out of it. But the reason why I put this out there when I did was because for the integration of brand and mm -hmm. culture. And the point being that if you want to have, for example, a disruptive brand, then, you know, as a culture – you need to kind of embrace this kind of challenger mindset and you need to be comfortable with risk and you need to be very, you need to reward courage. And so, you know, that, that was why I did it is because, you know, I think that some people feel like, oh, well, we have a good culture and it's like, great. A good culture is a great baseline, but you need to have a unique culture. You need to have your people working and thinking in a way that produces the specific result you want. This and and part of that result is the kind of brand positioning that you want. And so you need to cultivate a unique culture. And so by knowing your brand type in Fusion, then I link each brand type to certain values that then you would want to cultivate and build your culture around. I see. So is it is it fair to think of these as not only nine brand types, but maybe nine nine culture types as well? Yeah, um, yes and no. Yeah. So, you know, I first started off this process, not going into you know, too much in the weeds, but I first wanted to just identify like nine types of mm -hmm. cultures. But what I found is that culture is so unique and there are just so many different variables and there were so many great models out there that talked about, you know, different types of culture that I felt like I'm not really adding, the com adding to the conversation by doing something like this. What I think is better for me to do is focus on values, core values, and what are some key core values that you need in your organization in order to achieve the kind of brand that you want. And so, so it kind of, you know, talks about culture aligning with these brands, but it's not as if I'm saying that you need to have a disruptive I culture see. per se. It's, you know, there are values that will lead you to have a disruptive brand that then you can build a culture around. Great. And and so just to, to be 100% clear, those nine types, that those are featured in Fusion? Yes, mm -hmm, exactly. And they're also, um, I have a online assessment tool to help people figure out this integration of brand and culture. So you can go through and you can figure out what type of brand you have. And so if you just go to deniseleon.com slash fusion, which is the website for my book, then you can find the assessment and find these nine types of brands there. That's great. I love that you make 
make all those tools available. So I want to ask just a couple of kind of general questions. And this is partly because I've asked other people this season, and, and I want to have mm-hmm. some sort of apples to apples across different brand strategists. Let's start with just brand strategy or, or brand platforms. Mm-hmm. I, I'm assuming that, uh, you know, in order to create a, a great brand experience, you probably start with strategy or positioning work. Mm-hmm. Do you yes. have any kind mm-hmm. of model or framework that you like using with clients? You know, we've talked to David Ocker and Marty Newmeyer and all these people that kind of have their own models. And I know there are different a- agency yes. models out there. Is there one that you prefer? Uh, well, there, I have created my own. I will say that it's very much inspired by Ocker and Newmeyer and Adam Morgan, who you mentioned to me before. Like all these great thinkers, they have just, I've learned so much from them. And I think I kind of took everything that I learned and put it into this brand strategy platform framework that has two parts, two pieces of of a puzzle, the brand, your brand identity and your competitive brand positioning. And so your brand identity is comprised of your purpose and your values and your personality. And then your competitive brand positioning outlines who your target is, what is your competitor frame of reference, what is your unique value or unique benefit, and then what are your key differentiators. Mm. And so by filling in the blanks on those two Together, you create this platform. And I love the word platform. I love that you use the word platform because it really is a jumping off point and really a strategic document that should inform everything that you do. Great. And and just out of curiosity, does that, when you do that with clients and then when you're working with the same client on the culture, do you refer back to that for for culture then? Does that become sort of a touchstone for both brand expression and internal culture? Yes. So actually what I would do is, you know, the brand and identity remains the same. Again, your purpose, your values, personality is kind of all the same. But then the competitive brand positioning that I that I just walked you through, I was thinking of from a customer perspective. So, you know, who is your who is your core customer or your core target audience? Um, what is the unique value you create for them? Whereas then I would recommend that you have a competitive positioning for your employees, you know, so who are the kinds of employees that you are trying to attract and what is the unique value that you deliver to them? And in that case, the competition is is where they might otherwise go work. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. And then we talked about the brand touchpoint wheel, which I take it is one of the big tools that you use to help clients build brand experience. I'm just curious, is there anything else that that you recommend methodologies or or tools that you that you use with clients to bring a brand to life? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another um, tool I use is an experience architecture. Again, this started off as a customer experience architecture, but I've been using it more and more as an employee experience architecture. And again, it's basically just a strategic framework that walks you through. It's almost like a house where I say that Mm -hmm. your your roof is your purpose, the foundation are your values, and then you build in columns and rows in this architecture based on your different segments. And then what are their needs? What is the experience that you provide for them? And then kind of what what are the elements that comprise that experience. It's just a a planning tool that helps you kind of break down your overarching experience into very discrete experiences. Got it. Sounds great. All right. Well, I want to do a couple of wrap-up questions. You talked about REI as a brand with great brand experience. Is there any other brand that you just look to as, whether it's from because of the experience or, or kind of everything else they're doing as just a great example of building a strong brand. Oh gosh, you know, I I hate answering this question because people all like because I always say like the standard answer is like <laughs> oh, Nike and uh-huh. Starbucks and and people make fun of me for it. <laughs> but I mean, it really is after doing a lot of research on the organizations. And there was a time when I was kind of questioning my conviction behind Nike. Um, although I I'm recovering from that and and I'm you know trying to understand what they are doing as an organization. But you know, no. Knowing what I know about them and again, doing the research I've done, yeah, I just believe that they have a solid purpose, very clear values, and they are operationalizing those in ways that I think are very compelling. Yep. How about books? So we talked about yours. Are there any, who do you turn yes. to when, when you're looking for a book? And it could be about branding or, or it could just be something that sort of inspired you and, you know, and is relevant to the work that you do. Yeah. Well, so I will talk about three books. The first is 
building the brand driven business. Mm -hmm. I believe that's what the title is. Oh, yes. Building the brand driven business is written by two consultants from Profit. The used to be brand strategy consultancy is now kind of a bigger consulting firm than that. Mm -hmm. But that was foundational to my understanding of brand as business and operationalizing the brand. And so that is a core book. The second is a book that I think both you and I probably refer to a lot, which is Eating the Big Fish by Adam Morgan. Again, I read that very early on and find that his concept of challenger brands and it is still remains today. Right. And just kind of how do you build a brand that is a thought leader, not just a market leader? And then the last is by Jim Collins. Um, most people know his book, Good to Great, which is a great book. But before that, he wrote with Jerry Porras this book called Built to Last. Uh-huh. And it's all about how companies are built, in, enduring companies are built. And right. again, all written kind of way back, but I think that principles are still, they're timeless and they're relevant. And they have just really informed my thinking about how do you build a sustainable business that customers and employees love. Great. Thanks for those additions. We, we keep a list on the website of these recommendations from interviewees. So we will add those to the list. And if anyone's interested, they can go <laughs> find that, that whole list. And then the last question is just given your success in your career, I'm curious what advice you would give to younger people or people that are just getting started in in brand consulting or related fields as to how they should grow their career? Mm -hmm. Well, this is probably, you know, it's biased because I kind of look back on my career and think about what were the formative experiences. But I will say there are three things or three skills three experiences, three perspectives that I think that were really helpful for brand building. One is kind of more of the consumer insights and analytics perspective, really like understanding how to understand customers and mm-hmm. how to understand what their needs are and how and how to then project that from a small research sample into you know your larger population, whatever. The second is creative communications, or at this point I would say creative engagement. And so a lot of times I recommend people go work for an agency. It will suck. It'll be hard. You'll <laughs> hate it, but you will learn so much about the creative process and about how to resonate with people emotionally. And you know that it really is this kind of human connection that we as brand builders we are called to make. And then the third is to run a PL. So be a product manager, mm-hmm. be a brand manager, do something where you can actually run a business and know all the different aspects of running that business. Because again, going back to the very first thing we said, you know, there really should not be a, a difference between your brand, your business strategy, and you can't really build a brand without understanding how to build a business. That's great. So you've got kind of the the data analytical side, the softer creative side, and then the just sort of pure business strategy side. If you if you cover all three of those, then you're pretty well rounded. Yep. Yep. Great. Well, Denise, thank you so much for your time. This has been really valuable, a great conversation. So I appreciate it. And I hope we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Rob. Great. Thanks for listening to How Brands Are Built. To learn more about Denise, visit denisleeyan.com. That's Lee, L-E-E, and Yan, Y-O-H-N. On her site, you'll find information about her books, speaking engagements, and consulting practice, as well as her blog and some free downloadable tools, like the ones we mentioned in the conversation. You can also find and follow Denise on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube. I mentioned in the intro that this is the last interview of Season 3, but I'll plan on putting together a wrap-up episode like I did for Seasons 1 and 2 in the coming weeks or months. In the meantime, if you found this episode useful or interesting, please leave a rating and review and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. For more on How Brands Are Built, you can visit us online at howbrandsarebuilt.com. I'll post a summary of this conversation with links to the brand touchpoint wheel and the experience architecture worksheet. And while you're visiting our site, be sure to check out articles about brand strategy, brand architecture, naming, and more. How Brands Are Built is a production of Heirloom Agency, LLC. Our theme music is by Isha Erskine Project. I'm Rob Meyerson, and I'll talk to you next time.